members of Sierra Mountain Guides as well. Um, a colleague of mine on the Mammoth Mountain Ski Patrol um, and a great mentor of mine and also a board member of uh, the Eastern Sierra Avalanche Center. And Neil's here to talk a little bit about the avalanche mitigation work that happens at Mammoth. So kind of a different twist on risk management, putting it in a real operational perspective here. Uh, thanks for coming, Neil. Thanks, Mike. I, I really enjoy sitting through the NWS presentations. I've sat through many of them over the years because it really feels like about an hour of them explaining in very scientific terms with graphs that they have no idea what's going on. <laughs> <clears throat> I love it. And I, but I also get it, right? Like that, those kinds of processes for forecasting, the amount of input, like I, I prefer to be more of a practitioner. I'm out there in the terrain. And one of my early mentors uh, told me, and I still hold true to that, we'll measure it when it falls on the ground. We do like the forecasting tools and we need them. Um, but ultimately, right, like what happens is what happens. And we're all hoping for snow and wishing for a nice season. And uh, I left that last talk optimistic and that's always a good thing, right? That's what we hope for. Uh, so like Mike said, I am um, with Mammoth Mountain Ski Patrol, and I wear a number of different hats. I'm representing the patrol today. Uh, I've got some great kids out there, and I have spent, uh, this will be my 20th season on ski patrol, so I've been out and about on patrol for some time, uh, as well as a mountain guide. I love skiing. I knew early in my career that I didn't want to be inside, and um, to uh, steal one of Mike's quotes, uh, as a colleague of mine, uh, I'm often surprised if I'm not surprised. So one of the things I've learned in all these years of 20 years of being a practitioner and 40 years in the area is I don't know that much. And I'm surprised every season. It's pretty amazing. Love it. Uh, we work hand in hand with the Avalanche Center as patrollers, and you might be able to imagine why. We can be many eyes, many ears, and many skis on the ground uh, before many people are going out into the backcountry. Now that said, uh, the, we need to understand there's a distinct difference between the ski area and the backcountry. And how we operate, as patrollers, but also as guests going out into the ski area and then recreationalists going out into the back country uh, is really ultimately almost completely different sports. The rush to the powder in the ski area, if you will, or the terrain that we're getting into and accessing might be completely inappropriate terrain to be in in the back country in the same conditions. So the information that the Avalanche Center gets from us is used as a small part of what is helpful for them to understand what might be going on elsewhere. I think the other really interesting thing with Mammoth in particular, for those of you that are familiar, is um, it's its own beast, if you will. Uh, I've been there long enough now and spent enough time out in the terrain um, that I think you could have your own zone for just mammoth because it's basically different from everywhere else. Uh, the wind speeds, the precipitation amounts, the temperatures are all different. It's pretty interesting. So my talk is going to be somewhat of a little bit of a review from last year uh, and also what our role is and how we go through our process and how that relates to that thought process of how you might operate in the backcountry and also on the ski area. Uh, so if we're thinking about last year, um, it wasn't too bad of a season. It was a little less than average. And I admit I am not a scientist, so I won't show you a graph. I'll just give you numbers. I'm that practitioner. Uh, so a little less than average in snow amount and water. Uh, but some of you that may have been around, there was a, a significant notable event last January 27 to 30. 
And prior to that storm, we had a 32 inch base. And in that period of time, we received 96 inches of snow with 7.9 inches of water, four of which was within a 24 hour period of time. Did anybody experience that event? Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty uh, mind boggling. Uh, and what that related for me as a practitioner is uh, we started seeing events on the ski area um, that we haven't seen before either. So this picture relates to some of that information that we were able to gather after that storm cleared about the type of event that occurred for us with the lack of snowpack prior to the event, the intensity that the snow and storm came in with, and our, our mitigation efforts. So part of our mitigation efforts are to protect our structures during events like that, where we're getting a lot of precipitation and a lot of water. So we'll use things like our howitzers in the storm to create hopefully lots of little avalanches instead of big ones that can damage structures and create danger for people, okay? Often when we're doing that, we have no idea what the results are. We suspect and forecast to think that um, we're gonna create avalanches of some size and note. That first slide that you saw, if you can refer back to it in your mind, was one of the things that I had never seen before. And it's also related here as well. So if you look in this photograph, if you look closely in these zones here, this looks like a glacier with crevasses. Can you see that? And it's actually a glide avalanche that occurred from a howitzer round, triggered a slide in an area called the Wazoo, went through the area in the photograph, and then triggered another slide in an area called the Dragon's Tail. And when it reached the far extent of what would be the skiers left of the Dragon's Tail, it triggered a slide on that old 32 inch base, which happened to be a lot of faceted snow that was 1500 feet wide, an average crown depth of five feet and ran through the trees in the dragon's tail for over 1500 feet down the slope. Uh, and I certainly had never seen anything like that out there and investigating with some of the other folks that have been around in the area for some time. No one else had seen anything like that either, but it was pretty impressive. That was uh, during that January 27 to 30 event. Okay. Additionally, when you start to see the extreme weather events like that in the Scaria context, most people, especially in a backcountry context, have enough self preservation instinct that you're not going to go out into the terrain during conditions like that because you don't want to come not be able to come home. You want to be able to live to ski another day. Now, the crux in a ski area setting is part of our effort is to be able to have terrain available for people, even in really high avalanche conditions. Uh, but some things that we ended up seeing that I had never seen before uh, is stuff like this. So you can see the skier down there. And if you look closely, you can see stuff like this. This is an actual avalanche that occurred. Uh, but this lift here is uh, chair 15, Eagle Express. And it's just a little steep roll here. And this person's quite lucky, lucky to not have been buried by an avalanche where we had seen an avalanche occur that's pretty sizable in an area that we've never heard of an avalanche occurring before, right? With that kind of a precipitation event, it's pretty impressive what you can see as an outcome. We also see large events in other areas. And oftentimes with a ski area, by the time you get out there, uh, your impression may be that you're just going to go and get the first tracks that you can and get the fresh powder that you can, but also relate that to the likelihood of what can happen when avalanches get triggered, right? Like when you want to go there to ski that terrain at its best, it's often it's most likely time to be able to slide as well. And for us as practitioners on the mountain, we're not looking at it from the sense of we want to be able to understand what the hazard is and then decide if we're going to avoid it our strategy is we want to understand where the hazard is what it is 
and then go seek that dragon out and make it happen so that we can open the terrain for our guests. Right, so a bit different. And when those things happen, like in an avalanche like this, if you're looking back up towards chair 23 there, uh, it, ha it can happen in a great extent to terrain that you would not suspect would be avalanche terrain. Okay, so this is lower St. Anton. And if you were just skiing there on a normal day, you would probably never think that that was avalanche terrain. But you got to remember what's way above you can reach those zones and have done so in the past. So one of the real big advantages for us is we have historic knowledge of the terrain and the occurrences that have happened in the past. So we have a good understanding of when things have happened, how they can happen, where they've happened, and how they might happen again. Another good example of extent. Good old Dave's. It doesn't look quite like this right now. If you have skied up on Mammoth recently, that's a good snow year there. Um, and so one of those mitigation tactics and techniques is the howitzer, and that allows us to utilize uh, avalanche mitigation techniques even in storm. So typically when we're using these tools, um, we can't see anything. And it's super stormy and super windy and super cold. And we're using it so that not big slides build up to take out structures, chairlifts, buildings, and so on. Okay. It's usually not very pleasant out there, but it is pretty fun to go do. And then we also throw thousands of hand charges a year as well. And it's also typical that we are out doing that. Uh, when conditions are such that if you were going to make decisions about going into the back country, you probably wouldn't be going into the back country, right? We want to find that dragon when it's at its angriest and make it run down the hill. Hopefully starting lots of little avalanches, not big ones. A little bit of what it might be like if you were out there when it was happening. another big year there. And you know, for us as a team, uh, myself and Mike as well, our lead forecasters, we develop our own hazard forecast, similar to what ESAC does for the ski area specifically. We have different zones, but imagine if you will, do you think those hazard forecasts relate specifically to the backcountry as well? Probably not. And in fact, likely not, because the differences are stark. We start our mitigation efforts early in the season and continue throughout the season, whereas the backcountry has none or very limited. We have skier compaction as soon as we can get it onto the slope from beginning to end of the season. And skiing mitigation from small pockets from the beginning to the end of the season. Even with all of that, right? If you think of Mammoth as a whole, we can still miss little things here and there. So that mindset of get there as soon as you can and ski it as soon as you can because it's gonna all be skied out in an hour anyways, which is true. At the same time, like a little discretion can go a long way in hopefully getting you to a point where you can not get hurt or buried even at the ski area. Other mitigation efforts that we do is ski cutting. And we're physically looking for the sweet spots on the slope that with your backcountry mindset are the spots you should avoid. But why can we do that on the ski area? And why is that a bad technique to use in the backcountry? We can do that on the ski area because we start with an explosive and then we try to pick up the little bits left behind called hang fire. So we're trying not to expose ourselves to large avalanches with our skis. And we know the history of that specific slope throughout the entire season. What, what has slid, when it slid, what the slide looked like, its size, what the storm looked like, 
and then what we're trying to go out and accomplish before our guests get there, okay? And we're out there doing it in conditions like this. So if you look closely here, it's a little bit hard to see, but in this zone right here is a crown of the avalanche that already occurred from an explosive. And then this patroller is gonna ski cut what's left behind on that convex roll. And then a crack shot out behind his skis and another avalanche started on the other side of the ridge there. This particular event, interesting of note, was early in that January storm last year. And we triggered a slide with explosives up higher on the slope that ripped the comm line cable off of chair 16. And so chair 16 was broken for a few weeks because of that particular avalanche and put some trees down into downhill as well. We also do a lot of cornice mitigation work out on the hill to keep those from being triggered by our guests and having the chance of causing any injury or harm to anyone. So this is one technique that we use for um, mitigating cornices. This is a little cornice saw that we use. We don't have any fun doing any of this. <laughs> it's very serious work. But you can see like something like that rolling down the hill would take somebody out that, that would be right on that traverse going out to the tail, right? And additionally, to, uh, on our extremities, we also protect uh, roads and structures outside of the ski area. So this is a picture of some patrollers on Lake Mary Road. So we do avalanche control work above Lake Mary Road. So we'll close Lake Mary Road and make sure that we start little avalanches onto the road so that there's no cars driving up and down Lake Mary Road getting buried by avalanches. Uh, we have a lot of resources that I do think are valuable for backcountry decision-making as well. And a big component of that is our patrol website. And if you haven't visited it, it is worth going to and utilizing as a resource because there's a lot of links that are specific to being able to make good decisions in the backcountry. The ones that I think you can key in on are in the weather links zone. So we have the point specific NWS seven day forecasts for Mammoth at our elevation for our study plot and the summit, right? And then from there, you can go directly to the um, discussion that was mentioned in the previous talk. And that backcountry forecast that he mentioned is also linked here as well. You can get direct data of current conditions based on wind speeds in the last 30 minutes, temperature, precipitation, all kinds of high quality information that might help you make a better decision if you're going to go out into the backcountry. It's patrol.mammothmountain.com. Patrol. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of tools and resources in order to do that. So part of the team that Mike and I are on includes us going out and maintaining all the weather instrumentation, making sure it's functioning properly. The forecaster from NWS mentioned that he's surprised by winds at Mammoth. And I think I uh, was surprised by winds at Mammoth when that wind head that I'm replacing, the reason I'm replacing it is because it blew away. Uh, and the last reading that it had before it blew away was 179. And those are, you know, industrial wind heads designed to handle things like that. And I don't think we ever found it. It's probably somewhere, I don't know, where do you, it could be in Dave somewhere, who knows? Uh, so pretty intense winds, we, we call them light breezes. Other ski areas are like, man, we get so windy, it's like 50. And we're like, 50? We're in full operation in 50 miles an hour. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, the winds that we can have. We also take targeted snowpack observations using test pits. We're tracking weak layers within the ski area. Um, 
But to be clear, like understand that what we're targeting on the ski area may or may not be correlated to what we're targeting in the backcountry. Okay, we, we get some weird layers, different wind directions based on mammoth. We get often more precipitation as well. It's pretty amazing how different the ski area is from other zones. We have a lot of remote avalanche weather sensing devices, temperatures, humidity, snow depths and heights, uh, all kinds of good information that we can get when we're out there. And then we couple that with those targeted snow pit observations and then manual snow observations as well. There is no substitution for feeling it, seeing it, touching it and measuring it. You can look at it on a computer all day long, but if, until you can go out there and see what's going on, it doesn't mean quite as much. This is our sesame weather plot that used to be this run here used to be called Sesame Street West and they changed it to apple pie. But this is the sesame weather plot still it won't change that name. So here's some automated snowboards that are out there. So when you're looking at our patrol website, if you're looking at snow within the last 24 hours, it's this board that's measuring how much snow has fallen in the last 24 hours. This is a picture of going out to measure that snow on a 24-hour on a basis. We're typically doing this in the dark. Um, when we're measuring that, what we're looking for is the height of the snow and the content of the water in there. And then getting a sense of like, what does the snow look like? Is it gravel? Is it big flakes of snow? Is there denser snow above less dense snow? Did the temperatures change overnight? Did it rain on the snow? At this zone, what does that look like as you change over the terrain of the mountain? And part of the products of those, depending on the storm systems themselves, creates these opportunities for large events to occur. Because a lot of our terrain is in the alpine, meaning there's no tree cover, uh, and we get these light wind events, we can see a lot of transport, and we can see events that occur that um, probably wouldn't occur otherwise in the backcountry because you're not using explosives and you're smart enough to not to go ski those slopes. Here's an event here that you can watch in video form. You can see that it's already started, but just to give you a frame of reference, you can start to see the crown of this avalanche that goes like this. All the way over to there. But now watch the video of it. This event was triggered with a single hand charge. It's hard to get a frame of reference until you see, can see the bottom of 23 and the powder cloud that hits the bottom of tier 23. And then this event turned the corner and went down to the bottom of St. Anton. This was 2018, is that right, Mike? Yeah. And then if you've been around for a while, you might be familiar with something like this. I, I've said all those things and that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, but this is not an exact science, okay? We do our best and we're gonna set things in play and in motion to try and make sure that we are stacking the odds in our favor. But because we're trying to get terrain open for folks, to have terrain to ski, uh, in the past we have made mistakes and we own those. And then some of our policies change based on that. So what you're seeing here is the bottom of chair five buried in avalanche debris. And we were lucky on this day, we did have avalanche closures up and in place. Um, there was an employee that was buried up to their chest. You can see the hole they were in right here that was down about trying to open this chairlift. Uh, and there were guests on open terrain on easy rider just behind the bottom of the chairlift. That were, it was just, that was all open terrain, okay? This particular event is, this is some of the debris field that came down. This is Dry Creek proper. 
And this is when it finally cleared what we saw. So you can see this is the crown here coming up through climax like that. That's uh, us looking at the crown. So the caveats here, and what we found interesting about this particular event is we had forecasted a persistent weak layer that had been strengthening. Um, the run prior to this storm event was moguls. When this event occurred, all those muggles were gone and down towards the bottom of chair five. The event that occurred here wasn't extreme weather necessarily, it was about three inches of water. The thing that was interesting that in hindsight, we looked back and said, well, that could definitely be a contributing factor is we had an eight hour window of time where the average wind speed was over hundred miles an hour at the top. And so all of the snow you can see above us had been loaded for an eight hour period of time onto that mobile slope that we weren't that concerned about. And really where we made our mistake in this situation was we underestimated the potential of the avalanche we were trying to start and its ability to run. We estimated that it would run and we had hoped it would, but we hoped it would be smaller than it ended up being because it took all of that old snow that had already been skied and moguled and put it all down to the bottom of chair five. Another picture of the crown. And so what we did here was a profile of what went on and, and why and what it failed on and how that went. So this was also from a single hand charge down near the bottom of the slope in a thin area near the rocks and it triggered that persistent weak layer and all of that mass that had been accumulated up towards the top came down all at once. Impressive event. Okay, here's some pictures of that uh, video you saw afterwards. So that's the crown from that single hand charge in that event. And it's pretty interesting of note here that the shot was actually on the other side of 23 and it wrapped around all this terrain and then stepped down. You can see this into this lower terrain as well. And a massive amount of snow. Here's uh, Glenn Plake standing below the crown, pulling his pole up as high as he can. Pretty impressive. Some other big events that have happened in the past. This is before we started using um, howitzers in blind fire fashion. Uh, this is the bottom of chair 23, completely buried. Uh, the top of chair 11 was destroyed in an avalanche many years ago. The original mountain man manager of Mammoth Mountain told stories of driving up that road to Main Lodge and picking up closed signs on the road that were at the top of Climax before the blind fire days. So institutionally, we're still learning our lessons as we go and trying to improve and make sure that we're making it as safe as possible and opening as much terrain as we can, as soon as we can. But part of the intent of my discussion with you is so that you hopefully can understand some of the challenges in doing that. So if you see us out there working to get terrain open, that's what we're trying to battle. It's like, what can we safely open? What can we have people on? Where should people not be? Right. So one of the things we do at Mammoth, which some resorts don't do, is we do active mitigation work while the terrain is open. The areas we're doing it in are closed, but there are areas on the ski area that are open while we're doing mitigation work. You may have experienced that. And then with all of that work that we do, there's still occasions where we still see skier triggered slides. And here's an example of a skier triggered slide. And really what it boils down to is we can't get everywhere. And I would certainly argue that more and more these days, people are able to go to places that they didn't used to go to. Meaning like they're getting into these little pockets of terrain that we haven't ever really had to manage before, partly because of their ability to get there, the equipment, and they're getting there sooner and sooner. And that race to get to that fresh snow is happening faster and faster. Uh, so we're always balancing all of that 
information. And even then, sometimes we're seeing inbounds avalanches from skier triggering that we didn't get able to get all of those pockets of snow. But the reality of mammoth, as a complex a beast as it is, is that shaded yellow area is our avalanche area. So if you know mammoth, that's pretty much everywhere. Would you agree? So granted, that's like the greatest extent of its possibility. But when we're in full avalanche mode, our closures will keep people out of all of those zones. That's the goal behind the closures. Okay, with a little bit, of, we need some buffer there too, in case something were to happen bigger or less or uh, more larger, whatever the extent may be, so that we have some buffer of safety, hopefully. Ultimately, the boundary is open. And I think that's a really good thing because it allows you to make decisions on your own, okay? But if you're gonna go through the boundary, as soon as you leave the ski area, what's changed? There's no mitigation work, likely significantly, if any, skier compaction, right? If there's a persistent weak layer out there, just because you were able to ride the lift to get to the terrain doesn't mean that the terrain is safer just because it's associated with the ski area. We do all our work on the ski area side. We're not doing work on the other side that's by the boundary. That's pretty important. And the other really important distinction for us as practitioners is our avalanche closures are not soft. It's not like it's kind of closed. It's closed. And important for you guys to know as well is it's actually a misdemeanor in the state of California to go through an avalanche closure. The other important distinction is it doesn't have to have a rope on it. If you see an avalanche closed disc, that's closed. And you have to stay out of that area. We stay out of that area, okay? Super important. I think hopefully with the presentation, you're starting to get a sense of why. If we're gonna attempt to do avalanche mitigation work during operating hours and we have guests breaking avalanche closures, what that means is we have guests coming into zones where one, explosives are occurring, two, avalanches are gonna slide into the areas where guests are. So all of those things said, like what should you do if you witness an inbounds avalanche at Mammoth? If you don't have the Mammoth app, take this phone number down. This is our emergency hotline phone number. And if something happens out there, call this number. It's the way that you're gonna start a process of hopefully being able to get help your way quickly. We have a lot of resources on the mountain, whereas in the backcountry you wouldn't have those and we hopefully can get some people out there safely as soon as we can. Gonna make sure you're staying personally safe. Make sure when you call the phone number that you identify yourself and the location of where you are. If anyone's involved, how many people? We need specific descriptions. Is anyone buried? Are they wearing an avalanche beacon? And are there any injuries? You guys may or may not have seen our hardworking avalanche dogs that are on the hill. They are an incredible resource, but they usually don't find people alive. And the reason is, is it just takes too long to get them to the scenes because the mountain is so large. You have to, the dogs have to travel. It just takes time. You can also, if you seek a patroller in the same area, you can also contact a patroller and they can start the whole same process, okay? Some of the safety tips that we want for you out there. Respect the avalanche closures and their purpose. And as locals and people with some backcountry sense, we are asking for your participation in monitoring the avalanche closures. We see it more and more where one person breaks the closure and then two and then 10 and then 20. And we've had to resort in the last three to five years 
of just closing chairlifts because we can't manage it. And we're spending our patrol resources trying to keep people out of areas where they're gonna go and kill themselves. So we ask for your help as well as people that are maybe backcountry savvy to stay away from those zones and teach your friends. And if you see other people doing it, be like, what are you doing? You can't do that. Because that helps us be able to open more terrain more efficiently by being able to get into those areas to do the mitigation work we need to do. Now that we have uphill travel policies at Mammoth, if you've had chances to go uphill over there, you have to adhere to those policies. It's part of the critical components for that interaction. If you're going uphill at Mammoth, when the uphill zone is closed, you could be walking right into avalanche control work. And if we don't see you for some reason, you can imagine like the possibility of what might happen. That's, that, I couldn't, wouldn't want to go down that way. We highly recommend you carry your backcountry avalanche safety gear on storm days. We're gonna do the best we can. That doesn't mean everything's gonna get done. The first thing we do in an inbounds avalanche is a beacon search. Something to think about. And really treat it more like a backcountry resort than a ski area on those powder days. Report those avalanches to us, have a partner in a plan. And we want you to go ski it, that's a great thing but do it with that more mindset of like, not to be the first one there in ski tracks, but use that backcountry mindset. Like if you see an area that's a convex roll, it looks wind loaded and there's no ski tracks there. And you've seen a bunch of other avalanches around. What does that indicate to you? Possibly that you could trigger an avalanche if you go in there. If you're there by yourself and no one sees it, you don't have a beacon on and no one hears you say anything. Oh, I don't know, we might find you in the spring. If you find an unexploded ordinance when you're out on the hill, what should you do? Not load it into your truck and bring it to the main lodge patrol room. That has never happened before, except that it has. Leave it in place, mark it, let a patroller know, and we'll take care of it. It does happen, but yeah, don't pick it up and carry it around. Okay. Uh, let's hope the NWS is right and we have equal chances of deep snow out there but i mean especially like that storm event that i talked about earlier the hazard of snow suffocation is super real and if you aren't skiing with a partner that can help you if you go head first into the snow it can have dire consequences uh, and i'll finish up my talk here with um Relating back to a, a phrase that I steal from Mike, which is uh, be surprised if you're not surprised. So the event that I'm going to relate to here at the end of my talk is an event from April of 2018. And in, this is in Fresno, Boulder. So this is our basically right outside of our boundary terrain. And we had a, a rookie patroller for that year. He had he'd spent the whole season patrolling, doing sweep. And when we do sweep, we're the last ones off the hill. We do tend to look outside the boundary to make sure nobody's out there. And this young patroller looked over there and saw something out of the corner of his eye and radioed in. He's like, I think I see an avalanche out in this terrain. And the reason that's of note is prior to that, I don't know of anyone that has recorded an avalanche in this terrain or heard of one. And the first thing we heard as patrollers was like, what, what are you talking about? There's no way. But when we went down to investigate this event, we came to find out that uh, what not only was it an event, but it was a major event. Uh, this had been three inches of rain up to the summit of the mountain. And this particular event gouged the earth with the water that ran through and pulled out pockets of snow into terrain that we'd never seen before. It was quite impressive. So this is me standing on the earth that was gouged out from the water and the avalanche debris all the way down into this backside of the terrain. If you're going to use the backcountry, we encourage you to do so, but use all of those skills and techniques that you learn through your education sources. Get the forecast. Adhere to the policies. Carry your safety gear. 
carry some way to communicate if something were to go wrong and plan on being self-reliant. We do go outside of the boundary to help people, but our, lim our resources are limited, right? We can only, we have to prioritize the hill first. And we're working right now as we speak on getting a new updated Beacon Basin Center. And we hope we'll see how it all shakes out. So keep tuned to the website to have it up and running this season again. And just as a reminder, or if you've never seen it before, you don't need to have a pass or a ticket on the skier to use this resource. You can just walk up and use it. It's free. Uh, and it's going to be in combination effort between Mammoth Mountain Ski Area and uh, the Avalanche Center. Okay. It's going to be right in the same place as it's been in the past. Yeah, right in Gus's up by Main Lodge. Cool. That's really my talk. I just wanted to talk about those differences between the ski area and what we do and what you can do to help us out. And hopefully you can use some of that information to make good decisions in the back end.